Good morning. Hi there, Congressman. How are you this morning? I'm doing really well. And how are you today? I'm excellent. I'm, I'm, uh, that picture behind you is interesting. That looks like, where's that at? I am in Sharm El Sheikh. And okay. uh, what, what this bazaar, wherever, whichever city that is, I cannot identify. <laughs> right. Well, I'm in uh, DC. I'm sorry. I'm not with you. I, um, I really enjoyed my time there. And I was sorry. Uh, Back. I appreciate you making carving out time today. I want to make sure that we ask you about your impressions of the meeting. Um, just a quick administrative note. Uh, first of all, thank you. Sure. Uh, I know that you're a busy man and you got a lot of things tugging on you to go different directions. We'll do uh, just a real short conversation, seven, eight, ten minutes. And uh, the questions are designed uh, to help you talk. It's it, that's all it is. We want to know what your ideas are, and uh, I'll just kick it off here. We do have an opportunity. If there's something that doesn't come out quite right and you want to restart, we will have an opportunity to do a quick snip and edit. Okay. But, uh, this, is me, this is me trying to find the camera to do a thumbs up. <laughs> that's, all right. And is, uh, any, is, is the, anything that you say, we will uh, make sure that we get the quotes correct. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Representative John Curtis, for being with us today. I'm in Sharm El Sheikh at COP27. You're, it looks to me like you're there in Washington, D.C., doing the work of the people back home in Provo, Utah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, great to be with you. I was uh, uh, in, in Sharm just a couple of days ago, but I am back in D.C. now. Well, let's start there. Uh, I gather this was your first visit to one of the UN meetings on climate. Uh, what were your impressions? Actually, my second. I was in Scotland last year. And um, it, for, so it's, that's an important contrast. Last year was my first. It was, uh, I would call it a learning experience. Lots of listening. Uh, this year was very different. We, uh, we went with a, um, a, a, more of an agenda to be actively engaged in the dialogue uh, rather than just listening. And uh, I was quite frankly impressed with the Egyptian organization. It, it felt um, more organized than what I'd experienced before. And uh, my impressions were, were very, very good. And how does your work with the Conservative Climate Caucus fit in with, uh, as you said, you came here with a message. What, what were you trying to get across to leaders from other countries? You know, um, I think it's, if not careful, people can interpret Republicans and conservatives of, of not caring or being engaged on this issue. And my experience is that they care deeply. Um, they have not always known how to engage or haven't liked the, the dialogue of those who do engage. And so the mission uh, of the Conservative Climate Caucus is to get Republicans comfortable talking about climate, giving them opportunities to, to express their thoughts. Um, I find there's a very important conservative message. Um, and by that, I mean that to meet uh, our, our, our climate goals, uh, I think conservatives bring ideas and um, methodologies that can help us meet those. And without those, um, it, it's going to be far more difficult. The, um, you know, there's an interesting tension, it seems. You, you were here with a group of law, fellow lawmakers. Right. Uh, the, in, our, in our government, the United States government, the White House represents the views of America in foreign policy. Uh, but what's, what is happening in this UN convention uh, under the climate convention, uh, nothing can really be implemented at scale without legislation. So uh, with, with that in mind, I, I, what, are, what is your read on um, how well does the administration do at meetings like this, at forums like the G20, representing what is really possible in Washington? Well, I think that's where uh, my fellow Republicans would feel, quite frankly, left out of the conversation. You know, it's no surprise, no Republicans supported the IRA, but none were consulted, right? No opportunity to influence that legislation, no opportunity to make amendments. And that's unfortunate uh, because uh, historically Republicans have shown that they will engage. Uh, I'd point to the Energy Act of 2020, which was a very, very important piece of uh, climate legislation that was bipartisan. And um, I, th I think when engaged and, and invited to be partners, 
uh, we're there with ideas and support. And um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that the Biden administration will consider us and, and include us in the future. By the way, I'll, I'll mention we had a, a meeting with, uh, not sure if I call him Secretary Kerry or Zars Kerry or, or Mr. Kerry, but we had a meeting with uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, found uh, a, a delightfully uh, pleasant um, willingness to listen to our point of view and um, uh, extended an invitation for him to come vid visit the Conservative Climate Caucus and speak to them and uh, was really pleased with that reception. So you, you mentioned the recent uh, mega legislation, the, <laughs> uh, so, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Right. Uh, I think I might be uh, gentle if I were to describe it as uh, a massive piece of legislation when it comes to borrowing, right? Yeah. So a lot of the energy and climate related provisions are subsidies fueled by debt. Uh, is it is it possible to move toward these Paris climate agreement goals of net zero uh, based on debt and subsidies as opposed to growth and, and other sorts of principles? Well, you've kind of stolen my talking points, <laughs> but I, I would say, uh, you know, earlier I mentioned, I think Republicans bring ideas that are very important to the success. And I think part of those ideas would be how to do this fiscally, uh, to do it fiscally responsible. You, you know, you, you talk about the, the massive debt we incurred, and that's only dealing here with the United States. There's there's huge call for more capital, right, around the world to meet these goals. And, and as you probably well know, Republicans would, um, would, would introduce a healthy dose of market uh, forces that would, um, in many cases, uh, deal without, without the excess spending uh, by the United States government. And that's one of the reasons we want to be involved in the dialogue. We think you know, the way that we would approach this um, will actually facilitate us meeting our goals quicker and in a more fiscally responsible manner. Uh, one last topic for you before I ask an open-ended question. Uh, make sure that we get in all of your, your ideas. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you approach, what, what do you make of the big agenda item here, both last week and this week, about uh, reparations, uh, sometimes called loss and damage? Yeah. Should the United States and other developed countries be paying uh, poorer countries for things that happened 100 years ago? You know, you know uh, super interesting fact. The only people that I heard talk about that while I was over there was the media. I, I didn't hear it once uh, from individual countries. We had a lot of bilaterals. Uh, we met with some, um, I wouldn't say they're representatives of South Africa. They're from South Africa. They're, they're not official representatives. And, you know, what we heard loud and clear from them was, we don't want handouts, right? Um, here we are, we're struggling. We've got the resources within our own country. We're being told we can't use them. Um, let us use our resources. Um, and that's, that's what we heard from them rather than write us a check. As a matter of fact, they were very specific. They didn't want charity. And I think if you look you know, historically, um, every time we've tried to use money to, to right a wrong, um, I think we've failed. And I think that you know, if we really want to help the good people, and I think we do, of, of South Africa and some of the countries, let's dig in and figure out how to help them. But I, I'm not convinced that writing the check is, is the best way to help them. What, what else uh, should we talk about? Is there something that you wish I'd asked? <laughs> well, you know, I think um, if, if you, you know, kind of the overall philosophy, and, and I will point out our, our caucus, which is which is, I believe, the second largest Republican caucus in Washington, D.C. now of Republicans talking about climate. And, you know, every time I say that, I almost have to pause and enjoy that moment. But the second largest Republican caucus is actually talking about climate. That's a, that's a big deal, and it signals, you know, that Republicans do want to engage. We do care about the earth. We do want to be good stewards. Our ideas are just slightly different. And the caucus itself doesn't necessarily promote any ideas, but more philosophy. And, and I and my colleagues are absolutely convinced of, of this, that, and that is that we can have energy independence as a country, we can have a thriving economy, uh, we can have low affordable prices, and we can reduce emissions. And unfortunately, too often we've been told that we have to sacrifice the economy, energy independence to reduce emissions. And I think this is why our voice is so important in this conversation, is to show a path, right, that does reduce dramatically emissions, 
but allows us to say stay energy independent, uh, have more affordable prices. And I, I you know, I, my caucus was actually invited by the European Union to come see in Europe what they were doing on climate. Totally by coincidence, we arrived the Monday before the war broke out. We were there while the day the war broke out and two days after the war broke out. And, and what we saw was not necessarily something that Europe would brag about, but we saw really the underbelly of their mistakes and, and well-intentioned, but also made some serious mistakes that have now put them in a position where they're producing more greenhouse gas emissions than before they even started uh, all of this. And the prices are out of control and, and you know, lots of things. And I think you know the 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 article that I actually liked the very most after, of our time over there was one that said Republicans bring a, a rational approach to climate change, and and a practicality I think is is what we bring. We we want to curb these emissions. We want to be good stewards, but we have to do it in a way that that works, right? And that will last decades and decades and decades, and we won't find ourselves in a position a decade from now where we're dependent on our enemies for fuel, we're, we're firing at more coal power, power plants like our friends in Europe are. And that's why I think the Republican voice is so important in this conversation. You know, there's, there's one thing, um, doing a little bit of preparation for this conversation that I think I will take from you as a lesson. At the Competitive Enterprise Institute, we often talk about uh, affordable, reliable, abundant energy. And one thing I, I saw pop up in some of your remarks and the work that you've been doing uh, abroad on behalf of the United States Congress is uh, exportable. And I think that's a really important addition to how we think about energy and energy going forward, because it's not just independence for Americans. Uh, Americans tend to produce clean energy relative to all the other choices around the world. And uh, being able to export that energy is a real boon, not just to ourselves and our own producers, but to the people that are then using it and receiving it. Um, yeah, and especially those who are our allies, uh, right, who uh, find themselves looking, when, when we don't provide an alternative, they find themselves looking to, to Putin and, and, and dirtier sources from, from an unreliable, quite frankly, enemy. And uh, this is a, a, a great opportunity for the United States uh, to, to help our good friends and our allies. And, and as you mentioned, we do it better and cleaner. So let's, let's use ours. And I, you know, I think to, the, to our friends here in the United States, sometimes who struggle with this whole climate issue, sometimes they say, look, I don't care how, about, how you feel about the climate, look at the economic opportunities for the United States. Um, this is, many people will compare this to a new industrial revolution. And we want to lead it. We don't want to follow, right? We want to lead this as the United States. Well, very good. Uh, Representative Curtis, Thank you very much. We're going to uh, pull these clips together. We'll excerpt uh, something here for our friends at National Review Online at Capital Matters. And I, I look forward to seeing you the next time I'm back uh, stateside. Likewise, have a great trip and, and be safe and uh, get out and enjoy that, that uh, snorkeling reef. <laughs>